many places in the world, torture is routine. I mean, it's, it's, it's a terrible, horrible fact. And it's one of the things that we don't really look at because we think about torture um, in some of the most more political cases or whatnot. But I think for everyday poor people in most countries, that we, it's, it's the norm. Is the world moving backwards or forwards when it comes to protecting the rights of people who are under arrest and facing trial? In the world that I work in, the world is moving forward. And that's because the people that I work with are traditionally have traditionally been the most voiceless people that the world traditionally did not care about. And more and more access to justice has suddenly become a thing that the world cares about. And that's exciting. So if you're arrested somewhere in the world, um, your rights are more likely to be protected? No, not necessarily. Okay. Um, unfortunately, if you're arrested in most parts of the world, if you have money and you can afford a lawyer, your rights will be protected. And you will most likely be able to uh, connect with a lawyer and the laws will protect you because they say you have a right to a lawyer, you have a right not to be tortured. But in most places in the world, if you are um, without any resources whatsoever, then your rights are not likely to be protected. So money plays a big role. Money plays a huge role. So let's talk about a more typical case, about the mechanics. How does IBJ first find out about somebody? In many countries, just the typical mechanics are that somebody can be picked up, and um, whether or not they're guilty or not may or may not have anything to do with it. A lot of times it's just they're, in, they're either in the wrong place in the wrong time, or it's, um, it's an economic issue. Someone's looking for a bribe, someone's looking for something, and they can pick someone up, and if you have no money, um, at that point the police might say, give us some money and we won't take them in because they, they're probably innocent anyway. Give us some money and we won't um, torture them. You know, at every step, give us some money and, they, and we won't, um, we'll actually get you a defender, give us some money and you'll get a court date. And if you don't, then number one, you're very, very likely to be tortured um, because torture, unfortunately, is the cheapest form of investigation. Not effective, but it's, it's cheap. And number two, Many people languish in jail for very long periods of time, from days to months to years to decades for some people, because they don't have a lawyer. So what we do is um, we do advisement rights campaigns so that the general public knows what their rights are. We also work with the judges, prosecutors, and police so that there's an ecosystem. And then we set up defender resource centers so that um, both families can come, but in the best case scenario, were also systematically contacted by the police and the judges. A lot of the countries where this was going on are signatories to international compacts where they promise they're not going to torture defendants. Right. Are these not really, in practice, worth very much, these brave, noble, decent declarations that they sign? I think that brave, noble, decent declarations are worth something, and what they're worth is they're, they're worth a, commit, a show of a commitment, like an open political willingness to engage and to work. But the reality of it is that, like most things, it's about implementation. And implementation is it's like the plumbing. It's, it's actually the hard, everyday, boring work that actually makes the protection of these rights possible. And that's where international justice works. We work to actually implement the promises that have been made. And this is a huge, huge problem for many, many countries. The act of watching puts police and judges and prosecutors on their best behavior, knowing that somebody's watching means that they're less likely to be corrupt? It's, it's the act of watching, and it's an overall shift of consciousness in terms of how things are done. So I, I don't think it's just like a one-time, maybe a one-time watching can do something. But it's an overall uh, culture shift about you know how things are done and, and the watching. So, that's about a shift in consciousness when you have a system in place and the defender's always there and the police as well as the judges have been trained and, and it's a different system that evolves. Is there a sense among legal professionals in other places where these abuses have gone on that it would be better not to, to really go by the rules and protect the accused and play the game the right way? I mean, is it just a question of um, calling them out? I think it's really not. I think it's really not a question of calling people out because we've been calling people out for a long time. If you look at it in 1948, you know, we have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and they, it says you have a right to a lawyer, right not to be tortured. So these norms 
globally have been there. We've been calling people out. But I, I work a lot with, um, with ministers of justice who say, hey, everybody's yelling at us. Everyone talks about these torture things. Um, also, we're based in Geneva, that helps. So after they get yelled at, they come talk to me and say, hey, everyone keeps yelling at us. But we're trying to do something concretely about the abuses that occur. We're trying to actually give people the support of a lawyer. You can't just declare it. You actually have to put the mechanisms in place, right? The protection of lawyer, the training of police, you have to put it in place. And so without that kind of support, it's, it's virtually impossible to do. Have you run into countries where abusive prisoners is just not only practice, accepted practice, but policy? And they say, we don't care about IBJ, and we don't care about Karen Say. We, we are going to do what we're going to do. It's actually our job is to, um, is to make sure that they say we care. And what we have found is that, um, you know, even in places that people think are, are not good, positive places, that if the laws are on the books and um, we have conversations, we'll always find somebody um, who finds us, who brings us to the right person with the right power, who says, yeah, actually this has been bothering me for a long time and I can do something about it. And it, it's, I mean, I can see it, you know? I mean, I can see it like a movie in my head. I can see the different countries. I can see being in a conversation in one country and it could be an African country and it's actually the person on the side who comes to me later and says, okay, I'll get you in the prison, you know, even though the person in front of me says no. It's just, it's different, it's, it's different. I can see it in Asia, I see it in Africa, but it's, it's all, there are always people within the system who are, who are tired of it. Most people are tired of, of seeing people being tortured. Most people are tired of broken down legal systems. Uh, and governments know that at the end of the day, the bedrock of a stable society has to do with the rule of law and that if it's not there, people are at some point going to revolt and it's a big problem. After the Berlin Wall fell, after the Soviet Union dissolved, um, after the Cold War ended, there was this burst of optimism that a lot of countries where justice wasn't played by the rules would sort of join the world community and things would gradually continue to get better. Have we stalled? Is progress not so quick anymore? I think that progress is not quick when we don't commit to things. And this is an area where, um, this is an area where it really does take, it does take a lot of money and resources to actually rebuild. It's infrastructure work, right? It's, it's, it's maybe legal infrastructure, but to, to rebuild a system, it's, um, it's resource intensive and the possibilities are definitely there. Although I do, you know, I, I feel like we're at a critical time in history too, where, you know, we either have to go for it or, or maybe the window will close. So it sounds like it's pretty satisfying when you're in a country that people even want to step forward to do this. I'm absolutely blown away every single time by these people who, these lawyers who are so courageous and they just, they just sometimes they get their butts kicked and they're, they're in so much danger. And, and, and a lot of them have just, just, I just came back from the Syrian border, have described even their own torture. And yet they so believe in the rule of law and love because they, they say, hey, even though all these terrible things have happened, if we don't, if we don't do something, and this is the something that they can do to assure that in future generations it's not just, you know, completely lawless, reckless, people are in jail, no one's defended. It's like, this is what we can do. And, and we do it not just for ourselves, but for future generations. It's, it's tremendously moving um, to, to be with people who believe that they'll do that one thing and they'll just keep going even when they, even when we all fall down. You know, there's things that we can measure, like cases, um, like trainings and physically people in front of us. And we also can see that there's been huge shifts in culture throughout the world on this one issue of um, ending investigative torture by putting a lawyer early on. And that's, that's, that's really wonderful, that there's, there's progress. Lots more needs to be made, but there's, there's sort of a wave of belief that we can do this together.